Hey everyone, this is an essay titled Cornelius Castoriadis, Auto Institution and Radical Democracy by Brian C.J. Singer. Introduction. In what sense can Cornelius Castoriadis, who lived from 1922 to 1997, be considered an important thinker of radical democracy? To be sure, he was an advocate of radical democracy, but advocacy by itself hardly makes one an important thinker. If Castoriadis deserves inclusion in this reader, and it is my belief that he does, it is because he tied democracy to a larger project, that of, quote, autonomy, or, quote, auto-institution, is with this larger project, which resonates far beyond the pale of political theory that the importance of his work lies, and it is in the light of this larger project that his more strictly political thinking must be judged. The project of auto-institution has several parts. First, there is its prehistory, when, in the 1950s and the first half of the 1960s, Castoriadis was the major figure, along with Claude Lefort, of Socialisme au Barbary, an important journal and groupuscle of post-Trotsky's leanings. During this period, beginning from a strictly Marxist position, Castoriadis began pulling hard on the thread of critique, tugging on an ever wider array of forms of domination or heteronomy to the point where, by 1966, his Marxism, the journal, and the group had all unraveled. As this belongs to the prehistory, I do not discuss it here. The second and more important part of our purposes concerns the elaboration of the philosophical basis of his project. The key work here is the imaginary institution of society, particularly the second half, although one should also include many of the essays in the Crossroads series, as well as one of the posthumously published series of lectures. Here Castoriadis moves across a dizzying range of fields, philosophy, sociology, psychoanalysis, linguistics, and mathematics to develop a general ontology of the so quote, social historical, end quote. And it is here that he introduces his most important concepts such as institution, the radical imaginary, the identitarian ensemblist, or Incidic dimension and the magma of imaginary social significations. I examine this dimension of his thought in the following section of this chapter. A third part concerns his studies of ancient Greece, more precisely ancient Athens. The latter gives his discussion a certain historical concreteness, as ancient Athens is deemed the first genuinely autonomous society, that is, the first society capable of questioning word and action its own institutions and traditions. The creation of democracy is judged to be integral to such autonomy, as was the creation of tragic theater, historical writing, and more ambiguously, philosophy. In this discussion, a number of essays in the Crossroads series remain important, but it is only with the series of recently published volumes of lectures that the richness of this component of Castoriadis' thinking becomes evident. I consider this discussion of ancient Athens in the third section of this chapter. The fourth part concerns Castoriadis' contemporary analysis. Here one must include his comments on contemporary events, his critique of the present state of society, and his advocacy of new, more democratic forms. This component, again, can be found throughout the Crossroads series, but one should also mention several books of interviews, as well as a number of separate works precipitated by particular events. As this aspect of his thinking is, in my view, the least developed, I leave it to the end. The Institution of the Socio-Historical To understand the turn to social ontology, one must consider the reversibility of the terms, quote, liberation, end quote, end quote, domination, end quote, not just in a, quote, actual, end quote, sense, as exemplified by the fate of Soviet Marxism, but above all in a conceptual sense, where reason, by the very ambiguity of its claims to the mastery of self and environment, proves less a tool of liberation than a force for new and more extensive forms of domination. This deadlock already appears in the work of Max Weber, where the increasing rationalization of the modern world, as exemplified by the bureaucratization excuse me, as exemplified by bureaucratization, results in the formation of a, quote, iron cage, end quote, or more literally, a, quote, shell as hard as steel, end quote, a thesis continued by the Frankfurt School with its vision of a, quote, totally administered, end quote, or, quote, one-dimensional, end quote, society.
Castoriadis would provide a critical addendum, a totally bureaucratic administered society is impossible, as demonstrated by his earlier analysis of the everyday functioning of both, both capitalist factories and Soviet totalitarianism. They simply cannot function outside the meaning, motivation, and individual initiative that exceeds and even counters their, quote, rational and framing, end quote. With the, quote, limits of reason, end quote, espoused, exposed in practice, Castoriadis sought to understand these limits in a more general theoretical sense. What, in its most basic sense, constitutes, quote, reason, end quote? A question he posed by asking if there were not some minimal kernel of rationality without which social life would not be possible. Once this minimum was determined, he then could ask what else outside, quote, reason, end quote, was necessary for social existence. In effect, to pose the limits of reason at this most elemental level was to point to the existence of another equally necessary dimension of social life, as it was evident that the latter can be neither totally rational and transparent, nor totally irrational and opaque. Consider briefly each of the two dimensions that form his social ontology. Reason is rooted in what Castoriadis terms the, quote, identitarian ensemblist, end quote, or ensitic for short, dimension of, quote, institution, end quote. The reason of philosophy being the interminable elaboration of this dimension. The latter provides the most basic operative schemas necessary for all social communication and social activity. What following the Greek he calls the Ligien, excuse me, Ligien, excuse me, L-E-G-E-I-N, Ligien, and the Toikhine, I don't know, T-E-U-K-H-I-H-E-I-N. The identitarian movement refers to the principle of identity, the first most fundamental plank in any notion of reason. Simply put, a social object or person must be given an identity, a relatively consistent, durable identity, that identifies it as this particular object or person. The term, quote, ensemble, end quote, can be translated as, quote, set, end quote, as in mathematics, quote, set theory, end quote. The self-identical objects or persons can be placed in an ensemble or ensembles, which can then be distinguished from other sets, which in turn permits the establishment of relations within and between different ensembles according to different criteria. To flesh out the analysis a little, consider briefly the incidic dimension relative to the Ligien, or what is central to it, to language. Castoriadis's analysis is not entirely foreign to the linguistic turn, and not least because he critiques the, quote, philosophy of consciousness, end quote. Although he does not stop at this turn, his analysis of the incidic dimension of the Teukheim, T-E-U-K-H-E-I-M, though focused on techne, remains similar to that of the Legain, L-E-G-E-I-N, in many of its key aspects. At the most basic level, language supposes the identification and desig designation of a set of discrete and distinct phonemes, for phonemes, P-H-O-N-E-M-E-S. Castoriadis speaks of these phonemes as material abstract, material in the sense that they can be heard and abstract in the sense that they bear a normative form that enables them to be recognized as a specific phoneme despite all the concrete variations in tone, pitch, and dialect. These material abstract phonemes can be combined into new determinate ensembles, lexemes, morphemes, grammatical classes, syntactic types, whose individual units can be subjected to different operations such as their separation, combination, or substitution. The latter included Saussure's paradigmatic or syntagmatic relations. And the sorts of operative schemas applicable to the signifiers can be expanded to the level of the signifieds, or to that of signs more generally, and even to the referent, once the latter is caught within a, quote, significant relation, end quote. For the signative relation indicates that the object has been identified. 
and classified, and thus at a minimum, can be separated from, combined with, or substituted for other objects, all of which implies that the object has a social existence, that it exists in and for society. This is true of natural objects as well, for once subject to the insidic operations proper to language, they lose their natural immediacy and acquire another proper social existence, properly social existence. As this rather simplified sketch suggests, Castoriadis holds that structuralist linguistics is particularly adept at describing the insidic dimension of language, what he terms its code, end quote. The latter is absolutely necessary for speaking and for distinguishing, choosing, posing, assembling, and so on. It provides language with the necessary fixity, regularity, and determinacy without which communication would be impossible. But the code does not exhaust the character of language. The whole purpose of the exercise is, after all, to circumscribe the insidic dimension of social institution. The question is, what does this dimension fail to grasp? here relative to the analysis of language. At this point, Castoriadis must introduce what he terms the, quote, imaginary dimension of institution, end quote. To begin, at the level of the signifier, the insidic dimension can identify the phonemes, but the insidic dimension cannot pose the phonemes. There is no, quote, rational, end quote, reason, for example, that English has the sound, quote, th th, end quote, when most other languages do not. Phonemes are not given naturally as material abstract entity, entities. Phonemes entail the creation of forms. A similar claim must be made relative to the signifieds and to signs more generally. Although the insidic dimension stabilizes a term such that it can be subjected to various, quote, operative schemas, end quote, that dimension cannot count for the count content of the sign, its meaning or signification. Castoriadis is in agreement with Saussure when the latter speaks of the, quote, arbitrariness of the sign, end quote, by which he means that there is no necessary reason a given signifier is attached to a given signified or set of signifieds. And Castoriadis underlines that the signative relation that attaches the sign to the referent and causes the latter to become a social object removed from its, quote, natural, end quote, immediacy, is also, quote, arbitrary, end quote. For it is not a logical relation, and it establishes relations between levels that are not equivalent, or a, quote, real, end quote, relation, in that it is not reducible to anything that exists prior to it, or finally, a, quote, necessary, end quote, relation ultimately determined by what it signifies. The signative relation, like the signifier and signified, is irreducibly a creation, one essential to any idea of institution. How is one to explain the creation of social forms, whether that of the sign, the object, or the relation that holds the sign and the object together? Castoriadis claims that it cannot be explained in rational, logical terms, that it escapes the terms of an insidic logico-ontology, and notably those of cause and effect. Social forms are, in the last instance, created ex nihilo. They are formed by what he terms the radical imaginary. Before I examine the radicality of the imaginary, consider the latter as a dimension of the actual functioning of language. However necessary, the insidic dimension or code, it is the imaginary dimension, the Langue, the Lang, L A N G U E, in Castoriadis's parlance, that bears primacy at the level of the establishment of meaning or signification. Hence, Castoriadis speaks of imaginary social significations. A purely insidic language, one thinks of mathematics would be a pseudo language. Rigid in its application, impoverished in its contents, and closed in on itself. A signification contrary to the semanticist dream of den denotative transparency does not constitute a universal form of commens form commensurate to that which it refers. Rather than being equivalent to its object, it is simply a reference point. Point de 
the parage, adequate to the always specific issues to which it is put. This is to say, a signification always points beyond what, is immediately, what it immediately states to what is implied by other significations, objects, and reference, even as it opens itself to other uses. In opposition to the structuralist claim, these referrals are not constructed as a discrete set of determinate diacritical relations, but as, quote, an indefinite bracket cluster, end bracket, of interminable referrals to something other, end quote. Thus, the imaginary social significations are seen as forming a, quote, magma, end quote, with neither distinct elements nor determinate relations, where the incidic dimension provides a minimal stability to what otherwise would appear as, to otherwise appear an abyssal, abyssal chaos. Still, the imaginary dimension constantly undermines this stability and organization which is why language cannot be conceived as forming an airtight synchronic pattern, with a change in one relation necessitating a change in them all. It is why language is inherently diachronic, always open to saying new things, the bearer of an indefinite creativity. The linguistic turn has raised the stakes of any discussion concerning language. One thinks, for example, of Jürgen Habermas, whose turn to language also sought to limit, at the level of general theory, the rationalist or instrumentalist tendencies in the modern world, to counter here explicitly the earlier Frankfurt School's, quote, pessimism, end quote. By the difference it Excuse me, but the differences with Castoriadis are enormous, and I will limit myself to just one fundamental point. What interests Castoriadis about language is not language's ability to promote an accord, and thereby, quote, ontologize, end quote, a consensual, contractual, and quote, democratic, end quote, moment relative to social existence, but the imaginary dimension of language that enables the formation of new unprecedented social significations. It is difficult to reach agreement even about the sense of what one is arguing about when new meanings are constantly being created. In contrast to structuralists, however, for Castoriadis, the flexible, open-ended character of the lingua ensures L-A-N-G-U-E I forget how to pronounce that. Let's see if I can long long character of the long ensures some communicability between different universes of meaning by emphasizing the creativity of language and by implication history, Castoriadis ensures that, quote, theory, end quote, is subordinated to, quote, praxis, end quote, whereas Habermas's search for a rational consensus, consensus, or at least for the conditions that would allow for such, would seek the opposite. A free society for Castoriadis is less one that subordinates itself to an accord that everyone freely agrees on, the one that is able to create new meanings and objects without being beholden to any principle of heteronomy, something that reason threatens to become. As an imaginary creation, language is not dissimilar to any other social idea, thing, or person, or indeed to institution in general. That is, to the institution of the social historical. When Castoriadis speaks of imaginary institution, he does not mean that institution is unreal or false, but that it is irreducible to a, quote, rational, quote, natural, or, quote, real substratum. Subst institution is sui generi. Oh, look how powerful is that. Fucking always say that word, but I need to.
Sui generous. Sui generous. Sui generous. Soy generous. It institutes its own world, an always particular world of particular significations, which is to say that it, it institutes its own imaginary. As such, institution entails the creation of new meanings, forms, and values. Meaning can be grasped only if given form, and all forms have significance and value, either positive or negative, just as values too must find expression in form. And as such, institution establishes what for a society is real and unreal, true and false, just and unjust, and so on in a manner specific to that society. In its imaginary dimension, institution implies an effect that exceeds any determinate cause, whether material or ideal. In this sense, institution implies a moment that refuses to fall under any law, whether natural, historical, social, economic, or providential. At the base of this creativity is the radical imaginary, the source of all representations and significations, including the first, quote, originary, end quote, signification that institutes the very possibility of institution as well as the representation of what is real or rational. The radical imaginary thus appears as a demiurgic concept, the idea of a cause beyond causality, an origin without an origin, some, like Carl E. Smith following J.P. Arneson, have rejected this idea of creation ex nihilo, preferring to see institutional creation as a more, quote, developmental, end quote, process. To be sure, when one looks back, one can always find a trace of the past to explain the present, although when looking forward, the future appears unknown. The question is whether the future appears unknown simply because of a temporary limit on knowledge or because between past, present, and future there lie gaps, however infinitesimal, that mark the presence of the radical imaginary, opening up the possibility of genuinely new beginnings by speaking of the, quote, historical, end quote, relative to the socio-historical, Castoriotis is signaling the radically indeterminate temporality of institution, but the institution of the socio-historical of necessity will also seek to counter such radical indeterminacy, and not simply via the insidic dimension. Heteronymous forms, in particular, will see to fix institution within what has already been instituted. By contrast, autonomous forms will be more open to institutions instituting moment. <laughs> As the creation of original forms, institution escapes all tele teleology, and thus what can be termed the primacy of theory. It is not or not generally a matter of intentions and purposes realized by the will of a subject in a world of objects. The idea of institution is to be contrasted with that of constitution, which opposes a, quote, sovereign, end quote, subject, either individual or collective, who would consciously reconstruct the world as an objectification of its ideas. The existence of institution is prior to that of subjects, objects, and their relations, which cannot exist outside institutions. As such, institution is also ulterior to the subject and places insuperable limits on, the, on its dreams of sovereign mastery. The alterity of the institution... Me, the alterity of institution is present in the indefinite and interminable referrals implicit within a given social imaginary, as well as in the mutability of the interaction between individuals. Indeed, it is present in the theory, in the very idea of the historical as alteration. Ultimately, however, alterity must be seen at least at the collective level as residing in the abyssal chaotic character of the radical imaginary which, being without a ground, les sans fond, I don't know if I'm saying that right, is always able to throw up other new and unexpected materials in the construction of another world, possibly an autonomous one. In a sense, when speaking of auto-institution, Castoriotis is trying to recover Marx's critique of alienation, 
but outside the philosophy of consciousness and its subject-object dualism. An autonomous society is literally one that explicitly gives itself its own law, nomos. More generally, it is one that actively questions its order, opens itself to the figures of its alterity, and welcomes its creative instituting dimension. To become autonomous, society must place the law it gives itself under discussion, which is to say that its law can always be disputed and possibly changed. The opposite of autonomy is heteronomy, understood as the occlusion of society's existence as auto-institution. A heteronomous society represents its laws bearing a, quote, external origin. For example, the laws of God, nature, reason, or history that would guarantee their truth, justice, and slash or necessity, and thereby place them beyond all possible dispute. In a heteronomous society, the world of significations is closed, in that any question that can be posed from within bears an immediate and final response. While questions from without simply cannot be posed, heteronomy is manifested and indeed materialized in the concrete institution of a society, one example being the institutionalized forms of hatred of the other, presented by xenophobia, racism, sexism, and so on, based on the simple solipsistic formula, we are good, the good is us, you are not us, and therefore you are bad. As almost all societies have been heteronymous, the question is, how should we understand this seemingly, quote, natural, end quote, tendency to mask the auto-institution, excuse me, the auto-instituting character of society? The ancitic dimension, by seeking to fix a minimum of order in the magma of imaginary social significations, already would seem to imply a moment of closure. What is more, questioning cannot be limited, but be limited, as any question is always based on numerous unquestioned presuppositions, suggesting the existence of the instituted dimension behind all instituting. But such general explanations seem insufficient, for they also apply to an autonomous society. When speaking of a heteronomous society, one is not dealing with signification in general, but with a type of primary signification, that is, an imaginary signification around which a society coheres, and which establishes common conditions and orientations, one that claims that society orders and society's order and sense are given from elsewhere. And it does not suffice to explain this primacy, excuse me, this primary signification as symptomatic of class societies. For example, without classes have, excuse me, for societies without classes have been heteronymous, while the few examples of autonomous societies have all been class societies. Ultimately, Castoriadis must place the root of heteronomy in the individual psyche and its development. Having avoided the properly psychoanalytic dimension of this thought of his thought to this point, I will say only a few words here. In a sense, Castoriadis posits their originary, excuse me, the origins of heteronomy in the quote, closure, end quote, that characterizes the primordial psychic state of the infant as it emerges from the womb. Drawing on Freud's discussion of quote, primary narcissism, end quote, he posits a, a first undifferentiated autistic state where the self, because it is without an outside, is, quote, represented, end quote, as being at one with the world, and where the, quote, representation, end quote, of the self, because it is at one with desire, is a source of pleasure. Psychic and social development involves disrupting this state of complete psychic self-satisfaction and self-sufficiency by introducing levels of alterity within the psyche, the development of an unconscious ego and superego, and without the development of a reality principle that relays the demands of others, a process that can only be painful, a source of much anger and ambivalence. Socialization continues this splitting, the social self always being at variance with the, quote, pleasure ego, end quote. Even as it relays something of the satisfaction of the original, 
indivisible totality through its identificatory schemas. In this sense, identification with a group offers a partial substitute for the lost sense of absolute ontological security and omnipotence of the original psychic monad, which channeling, excuse me, while channeling destructive urges outward to the designated other. Thus, closure at the institutional level appears a compensation for the loss of closure and the subsequent vulnerability at the level of the individual self. Tolerance, the capacity to treat others as equal without being similar, thus represents a tremendous achievement at both a psychic and social level. It supposes a splitting within which allows the self to recognize its own alterity and vulnerability and renders possible a splitting without, that is, the distanciation of the self from the instituted, which permits the questioning of the closure of meaning. To return to the more broadly institutional level, such closure can occur in the name of the supernatural divine revelation, nature, reason, the laws of history, the invisible hand, or the being thus of being. The more, quote, transcendental, end quote, principles are the more heteronymous, as they push the basis of institution further outside the realms of human action and compensation, excuse me, and comprehension. The more imminent principles, by contrast, promise human understanding, but seek to dictate the direction of human action. Ultimately, Castoriadis attributes the heteronymous tendencies specific to the modern world to the imaginary extension of the ensidic dimension in reason. Rationalization variously understood becomes our god, although in contrast to the other principles of heteronomy, it bears no internal limit. Thus, even as it occludes the creative character of human history, Rationalization subjects our world to uncontrollable dynamics. It's in seeking to circumscribe the ensidic dimension, Castoriadis seeks to provide the philosophical basis for questioning and ultimately limiting these dynamics. At this level of abstraction, the discussion of auto-institution, however important, can only be a beginning. It does not address the question of the content of an autonomous society. It does not question the purpose of institution, institution for institution's sake or creativity for creativity's sake hardly makes sense. Even less does it speak to the form of the political, economic, and cultural institutions of an autonomous society. Lim admittedly, these are questions that can never receive a definitive response, for they are questions that must remain questions, subject to continuous discussion and action, if an autonomous society is to remain autonomous. Yet one feels the need to say more. Should one not, relative to an autonomous society, give content to one's arguments and argue for particular values and arrangements? By itself, a negative social ontology can provide neither the arguments nor the concepts with which such arguments can be constructed. <laughs> but the latter, if not the earlier Castoriadis, does not really engage in such argumentation. Instead, we see a comprehensive discussion of ancient Athens and more generally classical Greece. Ancient Greece and Democracy Castoriadis is hardly the first to return to the ancients, but his return is different, for he understands the extraordinary historical creativity of ancient Greece between the 7th and 4th centuries BC, which saw the rise of democracy and the invention of rhetoric, philosophy, history, and tragic theater as precisely a movement towards autonomy. This immediately contrasts his interpretation with those who, like Leo Strauss or Alasdair MacIntyre, seek in the ancients, or in their metaphysics, a return to, quote, perennial truths, end quote, that would provide a, quote, objective, end quote, basis for morality, law, politics, and or the philosophical life. 
Castoriadis emphasizes a kinship between philosophy and democracy. Both, quote, participate in the same fundamental creation, that is, in the questioning of the given, whether of political institutions in the narrow sense of the global institution, the representation of the world, end quote. As such, he criticizes the anti-democratic tradition associated with Plato, and it seeks within the terms of philosophy to provide a definite response to the, quote, question of the given, end quote not least by treating political questions as a matter of episteme limited to those schooled in the proper, quote, science, end quote, rather than as a matter for the general public to decide. At the same time, Castoriadis invinces little sympathy for the critique of metaphysics associated with Nietzsche or Heidegger. In contrast to Nietzsche, he does not see Socrates as introducing a principle or rationality or in the case of Euripides, psychological rationality, contrary to the mores of the aristocratic society which marks the decadence of the polis and tragic theater. As for Heidegger, Castoriadis rejects, among other things, the idea of a, quote, ontological difference, end quote, an idea that he deems completely foreign to the Greeks, end quote, an avatar of that idea central to philosophy which imposes an infinite distance between one thing, God, and everything else, i.e. the creatures, end quote. Ultimately, Castoriadis' return to Greece is not, or not simply, a return to philosophy, as philosophy typically entails the subordination of the vita activa to a vita contemplativa which itself seeks a principle of certitude. Thus he prefers to cite from Pericles' funeral oration as narrated by Thucydides, a phrase he sees as epitomizing the character of the polis. Quote, we love beauty without excess and philosophize without softness, end quote, which he interprets as meaning we act together after reflection and we think and act boldly. In a sense, Castoriadis is closer to those who would revive the civic republican tradition in order to reintroduce a more robust notion of equality and participation and to criticize the contemporary fixation on negative liberty. Still, for Castoriadis, equality and participation do not of themselves require the active questioning that characterizes an autonomous society as evidenced by Sparta, which he disparages, and to a lesser degree, Republican Rome, which he largely ignores. Moreover, the Athenian political experience must be situated within a larger Greek ethos, which is why he also speaks of poets, tragedians, and historians, as well as philosophers. Perhaps the first Castoriadis, excuse me, perhaps the figure Castoriadis most resembles in his return to the ancients is Hannah Arendt. Yet he criticizes Arendt as well as the ancients for bringing a halt to the political realm and, therefore, to political questioning. Before the realms of work and labor, the domestic household, or oikos, but also what Arendt terms the, quote, social, end quote. Castoriadis is aware that just as all instituting is based in the instituted and all questioning is based in what remains unquestioned, so political action must be grounded in pre-political activity, but there can be no a priori categorical response to the political question par excellence. The question of where exactly the line dividing the political and non-political should be drawn. Arendt, if not the Athenians, tends to remove substantive content from the political realm, seeing in the latter the revelation in word and action of the self as driven by a quest for, quote, immaterial, excuse me, quote, immortal, end quote, fame. But beyond the fact that such a quest is inherently, quote, aristocratic, end quote, as fame is meaningless if not reserved for the few, if the political realm were merely a place for self-expression or self-affirmation, there would be no, quote, statesman, end quote, pursuing an idea of the public good, only demagogues pursuing their personal projects Periat, periat, 
mundus. <laughs> the purpose of the polis and of citizens' political action concerns good governance, and beyond good governance, the legislation of good laws, the laws being integral to the political realm, and not as in a rent, being like the city walls, circumscribing that realm without being of itself. This is what why political action for the Greeks entailed not just individual agnostics, but also philia, or friendship. Considering now Castoriotis' substantive discussion of ancient democracy, it can be divided into two major topics, democratic auto-institution and the auto-limitation of that institution. Regarding the first topic, democracy for Castoriotis is not defined by a constitution, state form, or static set of institutions. Rather, it is a process whereby a society institutionalizes itself in a way that allows for constant questioning of its established arrangements through public discussion as opposed to private violence, thereby opening up the question of both individual and collective liberty. To quote Pericles again, democracy is autonomous, gives itself its own law, autodikos, judges itself, and Autoteles governs itself, a division that implies an articulation, not a separation of powers, with the citizen participating actively in all three branches. As such, democracy requires isigoria, an equal right to free speech among citizens, parhegia, an obligation to speak frankly, and paideia, the citizen's education understood as a lifelong achievement. The citizen participates not only in large public assemblies in the Agora, but in many smaller assemblies and committees to which he is appointed by lot. Elections are limited to those positions that demand expertise. For example, the position of military commander which demands specialized knowledge in military strategy. Elections must be limited because they are inherently aristocratic, there being necessarily only a few experts. And the reason for electing experts is that the best judge of their expertise is the citizen body that employs their services and not other experts. The position, supposition here is that there can be no expertise relative to general, properly political matters because they concern everyone. The citizen both governs and is governed, but in turn, there being no position of rule that would, quote, represent, end quote, the citizen body, although there are leaders. With citizens so active, it is hard to speak of a, quote, state, end quote, particularly a state separated from, quote, civil society, end quote. There are administrative functions, but no, quote, bureaucracy, end quote, and many of the administrative positions having little status are filled by slaves. Castoriadis notes that there were mechanisms for focusing attention on the general interest, for example. Those in outlying areas could not vote on matters of war and peace, as they could not be expected to hold disinterested positions. Excuse me, disinterested opinions, given that in times of war their farms probably would be pillaged. And there were mechanisms that served to create a distance between the citizen body and its decisions. What might be termed a space for second thoughts. Castoriadis mentions the apate tau temu, which allowed one to be accused of having a decision passed on the basis of false information. And the grafe paranomon which allowed one to be accused of having a decision passed in the heat of momentary passions, which would not stand up to scrutiny on second reading. At this point, we are beginning to discuss how Athenian democracy sought to limit itself relative to its own worst tendencies. The discussion of such auto-limitation, however, requires that we encompass more than political institutions narrowly considered. <clears throat> 
The problem of auto-limitation is not restricted to a concern with limiting the threat of a separate oppressive power. What is equally important for the project of auto-institution is confronting the fragile and unpredictable character of human action. For the critique of heteronomy denies that there is any guarantee that justice will be served. The good realized and the future bettered. For Castoriadis, Athenian democracy and Greek culture more generally demonstrate an awareness of the limits of the human condition in the, quote, flesh, end quote, of its social significations and institutions. Thus, Castoriadis insists that Greek city-states did not have constitutions in the modern sense, formed from fundamental laws based on truths held to be self-evident. Human laws, nomoi, were considered to be artificial, quote, conventions, end quote, human creations distinct from the, quote, necessity, end quote, of natural laws, phusis. Thus, to repeat, political thinking appeared based on doxa, which, po while political action was understood in terms of phronesis, which supposes an indefinite sphere of deliberation dependent on seizing the opportune moment. More generally, Castoriadis claims that Homer, Hesiod, Anaximander, Heraclitus, and probably more of the soph excuse me, probably many of the sophists saw chaos as preceding cosmos and as coexistence with both the natural and human order. The cosmos, in effect, was deemed not to be entirely orderly, being subjected to processes of creation and destruction that exceed human understanding. Violence, and by implication, injustice, were, therefore, seen as endemic, even fundamental. The polis and its justice sought to overcome the chaos represented by violence, but both were understood as supposing violence, as the citizen must be willing to use force to defend the city and uphold justice. This is in contrast to Christianity, where violence appears as neither the being nor the end of the world, and where, therefore, one can imagine a future and a past before the fall. Where the lion lies down with the lamb. In this regard, Greek religion provided little solace. The god's moral behavior was no better than that of humans, and the afterlife was a mere shadow of present life. It is, however, in the classic tragedies, which were far more public and thus political than our own theatrical productions, that the Greeks' awareness of the limits of human action was most evident. The tragedies present the chaos of human affairs due to the lack of correspondence between our desires, decisions, and the meaning of our acts. Hubris is to be understood precisely as a failure to understand one's limits, a failure that is always possible because one's knowledge of oneself is necessarily imperfect and incomplete not least because it is impossible to define these limits according to some abstract rule valid for all occasions. Castoriadis spends considerable time analyzing individual plays. For example, he, he highlights the line from the chorus in Antigone that speaks of, quote, man is the most surprising and terrible of beings, end quote, and interprets it as claiming that because humans create their own world, rather than simply finding themselves in the world like gods or animals, they are necessarily a risk to themselves. The play itself is understood not in terms of an opposition between the law of the family and that of the city, or between individual conscience and raison d'etat, as in Hegel, Lacan, or Judith Butler. Rather, the core of the tragedy lies, according to Castoriadis, in the claim on the part of both Antigone and Creon, to, quote, monus fronine, end quote, to think not so much for themselves as by themselves, as if they were each the only person truly capable of thinking. But the problem of hubris cannot be limited to the tragedies. Castoriadis understands Socrates as a hubristic hero, a good citizen who continuously questioned his fellow citizens in the search for truth, but who even as he claimed to know only what that he did not know, demonstrates that he knew more than his interlocutors without, however, offering a positive argument. 
thereby putting into question the democratic postulate of universal competence. Above all, there is the tragedy of Athenian democracy itself, undermined by its imperial pretensions and the rash decisions taken during the Peloponnesian War. Still, the claim is that the question of limits can be properly posed only from within an autonomous society. Contemporary Society and Democracy All right, hey. Castoriadis sees a second project of auto-institution in modern Europe, beginning at the earliest in the 13th century and continuing arguably into the present. Because such a project is contrary to the general bent of human institution and has appeared only twice in history, Castoriadis sometimes adopts a militantly pro-Western attitude that on occasion can greet. In his defense, he would argue that only an autonomous society is capable of questioning its own ethnocentrism, claiming that the Greeks were the first to adopt non-ethnocentric attitudes towards, in this case, the barbarians. Admittedly, when pushed, he does not deny that other cultures do not question their institutions, but adds that such questioning remains limited. Still, the West cannot in any concrete sense provide a model for other parts of the world, and he opposes all imperial projects. The attempt to impose autonomy by heteronymous means being, in principle, a contradiction in terms that can have only disastrous results when put into practice. Still, despite his Eurocentric tendencies, Castoriadis remains deeply ambivalent about the second project, for it includes not just the democratic project that questions traditional authorities and criticizes the sources of domination, but also the imaginary elaboration of the insidic dimension that results in the autonomization of the techno-scientific and economic dimensions, with their dreams of limitless accumulation, the indefinite conquest of nature, and the boundless pursuit of private pleasures. Between the two poles, that of autonomy and that of limitless rational mastery, it is the second that is triumph triumphing. To the point where he refuses to speak of Western countries as democracies and decries a general cultural decline, the sign of an ever more general ebbing of imagination and creativity. One would have thought that Castoriadis's quote, ontological labors, end quote, could have allowed for a more nuanced and mediated view of the present. It is not that there is no relation between autonomy and rationality. After all, reason struggles against all inherited claims. while refusing the strictly imaginary claims to a world already saturated with meaning. Moreover, he would claim that there can be auto-institution without some notion of reason. And even that reason can never be grounded in its own rationality, being always accompanied by an imaginary elaboration that extends far beyond filling a few foundational holes. One wonders, therefore, if the advocate me, avocation of autonomy, and not just the techno-scientific economic imaginary, bears a relation to the fragmentation and disorientation of contemporary individuals that Castoriadis otherwise condemns. One might think that, with at least two interrelated if immutable poles, Castoriadis would posit different spheres, analyze their articulations, and point to the resulting tensions, conflicts, and opportunities. And even if one were to pose but one pole based on a single master signifier, on the grounds suggested in some of his writings that only such a primary signification can provide a minimal unity and coherence to society, does not his analysis suggest that this pole could never be exhaustive or societal excuse me, exhaustive of societal institution? Again, do his investigations of the socio historical not demonstrate the illusory character of both the determinism claimed by at least certain versions of techno-science and a voluntarism seduced by the idea of mastery. Should not their illusory character suggest a more complicated, 
underlying reality, leading to a deeper, more sophisticated examination of the present horizon. One is left instead with a diagnosis reminiscent of the, quote, one-dimensional, end quote, society of the Frankfurt School's first generation, although here it leans more towards simple denunciation than analysis. Castoriadis could reply that he is speaking only of is that he is speaking only Cassandra like <laughs> of certain tendencies. The result, however, suggests a politics of radical rupture, where the appeal to the creativity of the radical imaginary threatens to become what Castoriadis denies the Greeks, an almost messianic faith in the capacity of the future to wipe clean the present. These points are not without relevance to his discussion of radical democracy. Castoriadis, like several other thinkers, distinguishes between politics, la politique, and the political, les politiques. He understands politics is focused on power and concerned with the decisions that have a binding character on the life of the community. While the political involves the conscious questioning of institution, that is discussion around a participation in decision-making by the citizen body. Thus, while politics can be said to characterize all societies, the political for Castoriadis can only be democratic. And the political can only be, can be truly democratic only if the political is not representative, for he agrees with Rousseau that representation introduces a division between ruler and rule, which allows us to be, quote, free, end quote, only once every four years, and even then the choices are prepackaged, and encourages a depoliticized and privatized life. We live, in his view, in a liberal oligarchy, not in a democracy. Not unlike Hannah Arendt, Castoriadis holds up the model of the, quote, council democracies, end quote, formed during the first heady days of modern revolutions. For example, the, quote, societies, end quote, of the French revolutions excuse me, of the French Revolution, town hall democracy in the early American Republic, the Soviets before the Bolshevik seizure of power. To the argument that we can have direct democracy, because, excuse me, to the argument that we cannot have direct democracy, because modern societies are too large, Castoriadis notes that the idea of political representation first emerged in medieval cities that were much smaller than ancient Athens. The Athenians had elections. They did not, however, elect representatives, but those with a specialized knowledge in those limited areas where such knowledge was required. Moreover, the ancients employed lotteries as well as elections, and there is no reason to exclude either under modern conditions. Indeed, modern technology could enable improvements in both. As to the claim attributed to Benjamin Constant, that the moderns are not interested in the public pursuit of common affairs because they are more interested in private, the private pursuit of happiness. Castoriadis, Castoriadis dismisses it as a variation of the much older argument that hoi polloi are too mired in their work to have the time, inclination, inclination or the, quote, culture, end quote, to participate directly in public life. It is thus no surprise that he has been accused of upholding a Rousseauist notion of popular sovereignty with its idea of an indivisible, infallible general will. In his reading of Greek democracy, however, such a will is not possible, let alone desirable. This is not to say that he upholds Greek views in all matters. He criticizes the Greeks relative to slavery, the treatment of women, quote, foreign relations, end quote, between cities the exclusivist definition of the citizen, and the failure to question the customary life rooted in the oikos. In an exchange with Chantal Mouffe, who defends representative democracy, on the grounds that it promotes, promotes, beyond the question of rule, individual rights and protection of minorities, Castoriadis replies that he is not against human rights, minority rights, or political factionalism. These, however, appear in his thought as no more than disconnected empirical preferences. That is, he fails to theorize any connection between modern representative democracy and the evolution of modern rights and pluralism, or the, quote, overcoming, end quote, of those Greek traits he dislikes. In truth, he is not entirely comfortable with modern pluralism and states that we do not have to treat modern complexity fatalistically.
Ultimately, it is up to us to decide what kind of society we wish to live in. The price of our freedom might well have to be paid in economic terms. But economic value need not be the sole value. And he personally would rather have a new friend than a new car. The appeal to the radical imaginary, however, was not originally a personal cri de coeur. Or coeur. I don't know how we say it. C-O-E-U-R. And one should remember that the idea of imaginary institution was to be understood in the last instance as unmotivated, subconscious, and anonymous. Continuing with the disputes regarding the character of democracy, consideration must be given to the arguments with Claude Lefort. Castoriadis's frere, frere, em, enemy since the days of socialisme au barbarie. Castoriadis claims that Lefort understands democracy in terms of indetermination, whereas he himself understands it in terms of creation, and that the former is essentially empty while the latter implies positive content. The criticism appears somewhat disingenuous, if only because creation, when related to the radical imaginary, supposes indeterminacy. In truth, the differences go much deeper. When Lefort speaks of power, he understands it in terms of its, quote, symbolic, end quote, function. That is, through power, Cat society establishes a relation with itself whereby it is able to give itself an identity, a form, sense, and value. By contrast, when Castoriadis speaks of power, he refers less to its imaginary dimension, assuming for the moment the equivalence of the imaginary and the symbolic, than to its narrowly institutional functions, legislative, juridical, and governing, or to its tactical or strategic usage in everyday politics. When the force speaks of power relative to the symbolic, he implies that society is divided, even as power is divided from society. For power as a source of law, at a distance from and in excess of society's, quote, reality, end quote, renders society present to itself from, quote, without, end quote. As such, power entails a figure of externality, and even of domination, one that is not reducible to class domination in society, although it secures and supplements the latter. Democracy for Lefort does not so much eliminate the, quote, transcendence, end quote, of power, as deny the transcendence its positivity, thereby rendering the place of power, quote, empty, end quote, such that it can no longer be occupied fully by those who would claim to embody that positivity. <laughs> Consequently, the societal order under democracy loses its apparent solid solidity. As that order can be questioned, power contested, and the social conflict excuse me, and social conflict expressed, notably in the form of a division between those who would dominate and those who, in the name of liberty, would resist domination. In contrast, then, to Castoriadis for Lefort, the externality of power and therefore domination and the conflict over domination cannot be eliminated. The people cannot and do not really want to occupy the place of power directly. And in his mind, any claim to such, with its promise, of eliminate, with its promise to eliminate social divisions, and thus the division of power, would be a harbinger of totalitarian rule. From a political perspective, Lafleur is therefore suspicious of all talk of auto-institution and auto-gestion, while, from a more strictly philosophical perspective, he suspects such talk of reviving the philosophy of the subject and its antinomies. Instead of advocating, like Castoriadis, direct democracy, Lafleur speaks at least at one point of democratie sauvage, where one struggles not over power but against the power holder, for the indefinite definite extension of rights and liberties. Thus, as Antoine Choyet, Choyet has pointed out, C H O L L E T, that's my guessing, I'm guessing my pronouncing. Why am I guessing? I have a. I don't know. Well, I, mean, I know why I'm guessing. I was going to say I can check in the Google Translate, but I actually can't because my fucking thing. For some reason, my um, 
Adobe uh, Acrobat, for some reason, like, just stop letting me copy and paste things from the documents, like, in the middle of, like, like I'm doing a school assignment or something like that. Thus says, Antoine, Antoine, Antoine Cholet has pointed out, Lafleur saw May 68 as a successful revolt while Castoriadis viewed it as a failed revolution. Castoriadis argues that the social division is not a structural necessity. Different divisions between classes, powers, spheres of activity, and institutions, and their purported, quote, foundations, end quote, in heteronymous societies, do not need to exist. Their existence is, as it were, empirical, specific to certain societies. However, quote, there is in every society a multiple difference with regard to self. Un multiple écart de soi, of an ontological character, such an écart de soi, which must be understood as referring not just to the individual psyche, but to institution more generally, rules out the formation of a transparent regime constituted from a single, unified, all-powerful sovereign will. In this sense, he, go, he would art agree with Lafour, where presumably he would claim Lafour goes a step too far, where presumably he would claim Lafour goes a step too far is in the movement from, quote, multiple difference, end quote, to the single division that posits the externality of power in its symbolic function. For Castoriadis, this multiple difference is manifest in the excess of the instituting over the instituted and perhaps above all in the chaos that traverses both institution and the psyche, even as it lies at both their source and limit. Chaos is without foundation, sans fond, Bubb bubbling, as it were, from below, the ultimate figure of the subversion of all power. The Four's notion of division, by contrast, serves the positing of a fun foundation above, which establishes power in its def difference. Even when, under democracy, the power is, quote, empty, end quote, and the foundation uncertain, which thereby establishes the appearance of a society that in its generality bears a principle of order, sense, and value. But perhaps behind these differences lies the difference between ancient and modern democracy. Castoriadis, as the representative of the former, could point out that it makes little sense to speak of Athenian democracy in terms of totalitarianism. On the other hand, Lafour is far more sensitive to the specificity of modern democracies, not just their representative character, but their pluralism and individualism. Andreas Kalivas has argued that Lafour presents a negative theology ultimately rooted in a medieval imagination where the absent place of power is a substitute for the presence of God, Christ, or the monarch. And then, quoting Nietzsche, Kalivas contrasts Lafour's chasing the shadow of the deity to Castoriadis who knows the deity to be truly dead. The argument is not without truth, particularly if one holds that pagans are atheists. As moderns, however, we might want to argue that with the symbolic mutation thematized by Lafour in his discussion of modern democracy, the continuity with a properly politico-theological era is broken, as power divides, and not just between its temporary occupants, the representative power holders, and its, quote, origin, end quote, the singular plural of the people who cannot hold power directly. Power is also divided from law and knowledge, which in turn gives rise to a proliferation of other differences and a host of other absent gods. The Greeks, because of their greater alterity, will appear the more radical. But then the Greeks, perhaps because of their paganism, did not have to confront the problem of the same and the different in the same manner as with the same or with the same urgency. They were free to imagine another different and possibly simpler world. The question is, are we too free to imagine a different world?